What do people perceive the city of London to be for? It's the uh, the heart of the UK, I would say. Mainly financial services. Yeah, global leader in financial services. Banking and finance, yep. predominantly. Banking, financial transactions, shopping. Businesses, all the bank people. It, it's a business centre, right? The city of London is a business centre. That's, that's what this area is, it's all business. How did this space become so specialised? It was the new economy, the post-industrial economy, which basically gave this opportunity to really change the face of the city. This was regeneration. This was the Blair decade of regeneration. The precise model that was selected uh, involved this mass privatisation uh, of very large parts uh, of the city. The big change in this country was when the commons were enclosed. And that's, you know, when people who used to be able to graze their sheep and things like that, suddenly all their land was lost and they were completely disempowered. In the 70s and 80s and 90s, when public land has been privatised, you know, it's sort of like an equivalent, you yeah, know, this yeah, is our yeah. land. But who gave that permission for the land to be taken yeah. away from the public? So that's one very big part of the picture, the private ownership of large parts of the city. Well, there's another part of the picture, that's the arrival of business improvement districts. It's a company uh, uh, which the local businesses uh, in the area vote on whether or not to set up. And if, they, if the vote goes ahead to set up this company, the local businesses pay a levy uh, to the bid uh, company, and the bid company then they would say carry out improvements. The mantra of these places is clean and safe. That is a good narrative. Uh, who on earth would want to see a dirty and dangerous city? But it's actually not that simple. What it really means is high security and this excessively high levels of cleanliness. It's a management approach to the city. It's based on a management uh, principle called Ma Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And clean and safe is a sort of baseline. Next comes marketing and branding. Then comes creating an exciting place. You know, there's, there's sort of four or five things. So it's basically these two models uh, which, which, which are responsible for this large-scale uh, privatisation. Now, the bid organization only come into being on the say so of local businesses residents do not have a vote so it's an organization which is run purely for business uh, by business Marginalisation. The City of London alienates people, encouraging a population almost exclusively of those in the financial and business sectors. Like most of the space is privatised, and this means that we don't, as ordinary people, and as protesters, the city's becoming out of bounds to us. They're just like putting injunctions all over the place. They're um, arresting people for standing in a place of your vaguely political. The fact that these supposedly public places have become marginalised makes us ask the question, what is public space? You can't say it's just a place that anybody can go into. And for two reasons. One, there are very few places that are just simply open. I mean, are they open to the poor? Are they open to people that don't have the cultural confidence to enter them? You know, the public space of a gallery is not open to kids who just don't feel they've got the cultural confidence to go in there. I remember my dad when we were kids saying things like, oh, that's not a place for people like us. What are the implications of this planning model? Impose restrictions in previously public spaces. So what characterises these places uh, are strict rules and regulations. No smoking, no talking. No walking, no fornicating, no old people, no skateboarding, no breathing, no, no shell setting, no, no nothing. Totally down, absolutely no, have no fun at the end of it. And then the bottom says, enjoy your stay. No, 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 no. This entails the exclusion of individuals judged inappropriate. The moment the 
they are privatised. They fall under that legal definition of private space, which is a space that can be protected from whoever. Okay. Why would you let them in and not us in? What's wrong with us? I don't want you in there. Did you buy it? It's not a Okay. But it appears to be. No, it's not. Is it easy? If I want to, I'll close it. If you want to, you might do. Within those spaces, there's only a range of activities that are allowed. And if you fall outside that range of activities, then you can, um, you can be criminalised under the law, or at least excluded. We assume that we know who is human and therefore who has a right. But as you move around the spaces of the city, you fall in and out of that category of the human being that has rights. Exclusion, fear, reduce social cohesion. Uniform, private security guards, um, CCTV absolutely everywhere, covering every inch of the site, as I was proudly told. Conscious interactions that occur between strangers who just pass each other by in a, in a busy place and don't even notice. But actually, all of these controls is, is, is undermining that process, and that's why you've got this increasing uh, lack of trust and, and, and growing uh, fear of crime. Non-democratic. No public accountability. Now, I wouldn't say that all the things that bids do are bad at all. They, some of them do some really good things. The issue is they're not democratic. The streets have become privatised, really, without anybody noticing, with very little discussion or debate. Loss of diversity. These very, very large-scale places, uh, replacing um, the, the patchwork of diverse ownerships. It exacerbates environmental injustice and creates a space for exclusive use and exclusive placemaking. On October 15, 2011, the Occupy Movement, an international protest against the global financial system, corporate greed, and economic and social inequality arrived in London. About a thousand protesters gathered outside St. Paul's Cathedral in a bid to occupy the London Stock Exchange in the nearby Paternoster Square. But the square was closed off by police and private security, and the demonstration remained focused on the steps around the cathedral after attempts to enter failed. Occupy. A place where people are not specialized for one single task. It's a duocracy. Nice big chicken casserole. Duocracy, so if something needs doing, so when I went and got my money, I went and got someone does it. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no one's forced to do anything, but it's like just generally accepted no that everyone should do their bit. You can sit in the tea tent, serve people tea, talk politics, talk solutions. So yeah, it's basically it. There's no rotor system, there's no timetable for working. It's just really, really communal. A space of inclusion and equality where goods and services are provided openly. where we actually engage. We engage with difference, we engage with the other, we construct something called the public in it. A place for all messages, dialogues and debates that does not seek to impose a certain ideology. You have like a steady thing where everyone knows where it is and just can come and exchange their minds. a site for the production of ideologies as well as um, just a, um, a social space. And one of the things that Occupy has done is to put some big questions that challenge the bullpark itself onto the agenda. Um, and I think that's massive. A place built for people rather than for businesses. Spaces which enable us to be socially embedded citizens, engaged with each other and engaged with the, the wider society. 
And I think in all of those ways, Occupy has made a particular form of space which enables that to happen. A democratic space designed for the experience of creating and sharing ideas. It's a place for the construction of negotiation, of argument, of contestation. And it is in that sphere of democratic contestation that we might possibly construct something called the public in a, in a very general sense I'm talking about. How has the media reacted to this movement? It's like, oh, they don't really know what they're talking about on every single journalist piece. There's just someone holding up a piece of paper. Inequality, no war, no poverty. It's not fantastic. Um, a lot of it's um, actually a smear campaign. The, the portrayal is, is invariably negative. I think The Guardian is pretty good, but I'm really annoyed with the Evening Standard because they have put some bits of information that apparently some guy said and it's just a load of, it's not true. That they've been putting us forward as, as something bad, but they, they, they end up having to list a lot of our important points in their, in their negative press and people actually, if they're sympathetic to the cause, they find out about the occupation. The City of London greatly influences the entire world through even the smallest action. So the city has been a crucial moment in the, in the invention, the articulation and the dissemination of neoliberal globalization. So this, it is not an accident that finance is at the center of things for this particular occupation. Through its global authority, the City of London enforces the dominance of the BID mindset when approaching the common. It's in our heads, you know. It's invaded our imaginations. And that's what I meant when, when I began by saying the common sense has still not been broken. The idea that markets are some kind of inhuman, indifferent thing, not a social product. That they're natural. Um, none of us can simply get out of this. It has invaded our common sense, and that's what Gramsci means by hegemony. We don't even know we're thinking it. It's such so deep as an assumption. And the kind of work that's going on here, I think, is precisely trying to get into those unthought assumptions, those things we take for granted without knowing we, can we are taking them for granted. And I think that is probably the most important thing we can be doing at this moment. For the case of the Commons, not only in London, but on a global scale, the hegemonic view of how they are to be used, the concept of how they can be owned, cut off or open, is accepted not with the value of a viewpoint, but as a reality, an unchangeable law of how the world works. We're facing this massive crisis of uh, capitalism, of financial-led, but not only financial, capitalism, which is an economic crisis. But what we haven't yet managed to provoke is what we need if it's going to be a serious political crisis, and that's a crisis of ideas. The contestation of the use of space by OLSX in the City of London challenges the current hegemonic view of the Commons on a global scale. Through this, debates are open for ideas to be shared and the current paradigm to be questioned. Space is a product of power-filled social relations. Space isn't just an empty thing, it's not just a container. It's absolutely, social space is made out of the power relations that exist between us. Ultimately, by contesting the use of space in the City of London, Occupy London is opening the debate on the concept of public space, allowing for the reinvention of the commons. Public space isn't just a kind of massive great plaza that people wander about in and never interact. I mean, it's public in some slightly vacuous sense. But a public space might be better also thought of as a place where there are points that people come and argue about. This could be a prime example. Maybe by being here, engaging with the stock exchange to the extent you can, engaging with the Corporation of London, above all, engaging with St Paul's in the sense that that's really sparked up a debate, maybe that is what made this a public space. Think about it. 